Sessions at the Eldridge Center. For anyone who has been hanging around the Eldridge Center the last couple of years, you will know that since late 2015, we've been running a program to help older, mid-career and older, long-term unemployed job seekers. Called the New Start Career Network, we have had over 4,000 job seekers who have come to this program for assistance. New Jersey has had one of the highest rates of long-term unemployment in the country, and many of our job seekers are looking for what we usually call the holy grail of a full-time job with benefits. Uh, there's almost no topic in workforce development right now that is generating more interest and debate than the rise in alternative work, or gig work, or contract work, temp work, contingent work, or whatever phrase we're using. Just assume that for purposes today, we can call it all alternative work arrangements. There are two statistics that we hear all the time. 94% of the new jobs created in the past decade were in non-traditional employment, followed by one third of Americans now do some form of gig or contract work, whether by choice or out of necessity. While we know that flexible work arrangements have some perks, for some people it lets them be entrepreneurial, they may get to do things that are more creative than a traditional job might have let them do, we also know that these jobs generally don't come with paid sick leave or vacation leave or retirement benefits, health care, or any other workplace supports. And for many, doing this kind of work leaves them in a constant state of financial uncertainty. We know that most of our New Start Career Network job seekers would much prefer a full-time job with benefits to whatever perks come with a gig job if those jobs were available. So to set the stage for this conversation, I'd like to share a note that Michelle, my colleague Michelle Martin and I received last week from a job seeker that's pretty typical of what we hear. I've not been able to find a full-time job with benefits in over five and a half years. I am 50 years old, about to be 51 next month. I send resumes and never hear back, or if I do, I'm not the right fit. <clears throat> I'd signed up with the state for a workshop that resulted in changing my resume for the hundredth time. Then I signed up with the Women's Center at County College of Morris. <coughs> they were all really nice people there and changed my resume again. I took classes to update my skills, but with no job, I can't keep up the skills. I was a senior administrative assistant for 27 years at various pharmaceutical and healthcare companies. I find it so hard to believe that I can't find a job. I have a crappy part-time job and there is no way to make ends meet. I always worked two jobs my whole life, retail at night and my full-time job during the day. Everyone tells me to start my own business, but doing what and with what money? With that, I am thrilled to introduce Sarah Kessler, <laughs> author of Gigged, The End of the Job and the Future of Work, and Dr. Lewis Hyman, author of Temp, How American Work, American Business, and the American Dream Became Temporary. Both books are truly incredible, and I can honestly say they were my summer poolside reading. They are page turners. Their stories are just uh, gripping. Um, if, if I were Lin-Manuel Miranda, I would be looking at how to turn these into a musical like Hamilton. I think they have legs. Um, so Sarah truly put her journalism skills to work, painting <laughs> portraits of the vastly different experiences of five gig workers of different ages, different backgrounds, urban and rural, some highly successful and others abject failures. Lewis's book could be an entire course on the evolution of the American economy, complete with uh, colorful descriptions of leading figures from Manpower, McKinsey, and other pivotal players in the rise of temp work. So our assumption is that most of the audience members have not actually read the book, so I have asked each of them to spend a few minutes discussing their books, then I will uh, use my moderator's prerogative and ask a few questions, and then we will open it up and really try and make this interactive, because I've already had a bunch of people come up to me and say they'd like to ask questions. So with that, um, Lewis, I think we, we 
We'll have you go first. Can you use the podium for that? Yeah, please, go ahead. Those illegible notes from my notes? <laughs> <laughs> okay, well, very good, yeah. 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 I'm glad that they are as incomprehensible as I thought they were. Um, hello, everyone, and so I'm gonna just spend about five or 10 minutes for giving you the broad outlines and contours of the book, which is a history book, which is something that might, might be saying, why do I wanna know the history of this? Because history is the study of change over time. And it's very easy, especially when you think about the economy, uh, to think that it's always been thus. It always will be thus. And maybe if there are changes, the changes are driven by things we can't control, by technology, by automation. This is the story that we're told in our history classes, at least before you get to my classroom. But the thing we need to start with as we begin to think about today's economy is to realize something that Uber is the waste product of the service economy. The only reason it's possible for Uber to exist is not an algorithm, but because the service economy has left so many other people behind. That the alternative to Uber is so bad um, in the kinds of gig jobs, freelance <coughs> jobs, but even if you have a W-2 job, if, if you work at Starbucks slinging coffee or at Walmart as a greeter, these are W-2 jobs. These are what we thought jobs were meant to be, and yet they do not deliver upon that American dream. Uber is the waste product of this world. It is not the product of an algorithm. It's not the product of an inevitable technological future. It is the choice that was made about how to organize our corporations and our workforces over the last 50 years away from a world that delivered pensions, benefits, stable jobs, and respect. <clears throat> now, when I talk about the technology here, I'm talking about a, uh, a world where it's about organization, not automation. And this is very counterintuitive, I think, for a lot of people who hear or vaguely recall the, the story of the Industrial Revolution. Many of you went to school, I think. <laughs> You've been to school. And in those schools, you were taught the story of the steam engine. You were taught the story of the railroad. This is a future that unfolds through technology. We can't stop it. Why would we want to? Progress, progress, progress. And that's certainly the narrative that is touched upon when we hear people in Silicon Valley talk about our economy today. Progress, progress, progress. Robots, robots, robots. And yet this is not actually when you talk to, this were a group of business historians, first of all, it'd be much more boring. Um, but we'd be like, that is not how things happen, because it's not how things happen. Technology solves for business problems. Technology solves for social relationships. And it's no different in the Industrial Revolution. If you want a steam engine to work well, you need to have people already in a factory. That happened 100 years before the steam engine. That happened in what historians call the Industrious Revolution, when people were brought into one room and watched. Technology didn't change as people made pots, as people wove fabric, as they spun thread. Technology was the same. And yet, this is what kicked off the massive expansion in early trade amongst in early capitalism. That industrious revolution, that reorganization of social relationships is what fundamentally matters. And that's actually what I think we are experiencing today. A reorganization of social relationships, the employer-employee relationship, as many other people have written about. But what I try to do in my account of it is really put bodies in the rooms. Where this is happening, who is making this choice, why, are they doing this? And in doing so, make it less a story of technological determination, or even simply passing the right law or the wrong law, but to understand the business case, the social case, the intellectual case for this transformation. I start the history in the 1930s where the stable work um, was made, the world where the industrial life where a factory, you know, we all hear in the media now how nostalgic people are for working in coal mines and in manufacturing jobs, which for most of the history of those places was an excellent place to go and lose an arm, or get black lung, or watch your kids die. 
and not get paid <clears throat> enough. We made that into something that delivered the good life. Not for everybody, for white men. <clears throat> this exclusion that is fundamental to this post-war world about who gets respected, who does not get respected, who gets paid, who's deserving of security, is fundamentally about race and gender <clears throat> and citizenship. We drew a little bubble around a certain set of people, a lot of people, a huge fraction of the US population, but yet we still drew a line. And on one side of that line, we said, you deserve this post-war life. And on the other side, we said, we can do whatever we want with you as a woman, as a person of color, as a migrant. And in this other space was rehearsed an economy to come, a space that now white men are realizing has come for them. This is a story of the making of that stability, uh, of new forms of the corporation, new forms of labor organizing. The centrality of labor cannot be overstated to this. It's a story of people who are supporting this world, the new kinds of jobs, the people of, who are consultants, who are kind of flexible laborer, right? They are the people who swoop in, fix things, or destroy things, depending on your perspective, and uh, also in the examples. Um, they are the temp workers who come in first to support you when you're out sick or on vacation, but then to replace huge swaths of the office. And they are migrant laborers who come in to do the work that is too, that people don't want to pay enough for, or is too dirty, or is illegal to do in the United States. And they can be done outside of the lines of sight of the rest of the country, and they become essential. And so in this story, it's a story of many different kinds of flexible temporary work from top to bottom, from high-flying McKinsey consultants who get paid a lot, to temps who get paid you know, pretty good, to migrants who get paid with deportation, sometimes death, sometimes being dropped in the middle of the desert in Mexico after they're captured by the INS. And this is the story of that world that was created and then it begun to, how it began to fall apart around 1969, as there is in the book, and I can talk about this at length if you want, uh, as long as you want to talk about it, I can, um, sort of the way in which 1960s corporate capitalism went off the rails, and in the aftermath of this crisis, this failure of the conglomerates in 1969, business consultants and business gurus began to offer an alternative, a leaner corporation that treated workplace security, job security, as a problem to be solved rather than as something to be valued and celebrated. I tend to tell the story through the world of Silicon Valley as that most essential rehearsal space for the rest of American capitalism. If Detroit defined the post-war, then Palo Alto and San Jose define the economy we're in today. People still made things in Silicon Valley, no matter how often you want to be being told by them that they're not. Every time someone says robot in Silicon Valley in the 80s, they usually mean migrant women of color. The advertising for the very first Macintosh factory was robots building robots, machines building machines. And actually it was women, mostly from Southeast Asia or Central America, putting those Macintoshes together. And yet their labor did not count as much as the men of Detroit. So this world was made in this new blueprint of a kind of industrial capitalism that had no unions, that had no respect for its workers, that was born profoundly unequal, and always legitimated by this idea of progress, of this automated future, of this imagined place where robots would do everything for us, and yet those robots never seemed to have arrived. And in its stead, we have an unequal present that is made possible by this imagined future. So at the end of the story, we come to the present day digital capitalism, where 1% of the workforce works in these digital jobs and gets 99% of the headlines, but actually a third of the workforce is in these freelancing jobs, or more often than not, in some kind of unstable W-2 job. And that this world of insecurity is permeated throughout the economy, uh, defining how we live today and how we are trying to understand the meaning of capitalism. Where we're told that it's our fault 
that we should retrain, we should all become programmers like they are in Silicon Valley, and then we'd be worth something as people. At Root, at Cause, we have choices over this world because it's not about science, it's about management, it's about corporations, it's about social relationships, it's about power. And it's fundamentally about politics in this way. That the battle over productivity, whether you're in the 18th or 19th century, or the 20th or the 21st, the battle over productivity, which is the source of all wealth and capitalism, <clears throat> is fundamentally political. It's not an economic problem. And it's something that we can, as we did before, make work for all of us. Only this time around, not draw little lines around who counts and who doesn't count, but in a truly inclusive kind of capitalism in the years to come, I hope. Thank you so much. Okay, so, you know, I think a lot of people associate this rise in temporary and alternative work with the rise of the iPhone and on-demand apps, and Lewis's research clearly shows otherwise. That said, Sarah is now gonna give us some examples of people whose lives are in fact dictated to by the ping of on-demand apps. And, and I don't know what stories you, you, you might tell from your, your book, but you've certainly got some, some good ones. Yeah, so um, my book kind of picks up where Lewis's ends, which is what's happening now, and kind of the new tools for this existing structure of kind of risk shifting to workers. And so um, while I agree that like technology did not kind of create this situation, um, I think that it's kind of like, uh, it's a little bit like saying, um, you know, guns don't kill people, people do. Like that is true, but it also is a lot easier if you have a gun and the technology is making it easier to hire people and manage them in new ways that weren't possible before. Um, so I first came across this like idea of the gig economy in 2011, um, before any of you had heard of it because this buzzword didn't exist yet. Um, and I was working as a reporter um, at a tech blog, and my job was to interview three to four startup founders a day. And um, I started hearing this pitch, every single one, they were changing the world. Um, and the pitch often was, um, we have created this app that's gonna totally end unemployment. And not only is it gonna end unemployment, but it's gonna end dull, deaf jobs um, and anything you don't wanna do because now you can just press this button and work comes to you. Um, and you can do whatever you want, whenever you want. Um, you can structure it around raising kids or um, going to school. Uh, it's this totally flexible way of work. And that really was the pitch. Um, it's hard to imagine like anyone getting away with that right now. Um, but there was a time when kind of anything that Silicon Valley did um, was considered, like it, it was given this halo of progress, 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 like Lewis said. Um, and so really that was the narrative at the time, was these apps like Uber, um, or this freelance marketplace online, um, was gonna help with unemployment. Um, so I go along, like a few years of reporting on this, um, and at some point it became more interesting to me, like what is the impact of kind of these new tools on the workforce um, and the people who are working on them rather than kind of the business story that a lot of people were focused on at the time. Um, and so the book follows people, um, as Maria mentioned, who are in very different situations, um, doing very different things, and kind of how this works out in their lives. Um, and throughout this, I kind of came to see the Silicon Valley version of what they call the gig economy is an extreme version of something that, you know, as Lewis was talking about, has been happening for a very, very long time, um, which is risk shifting to workers, whether that's in a W-2 situation, you know, you used to have pensions, now you have 401ks, you used to have a full-time job now, everybody's working 29 hours a week, um, you know, and then there's another version of that, which is kind of not being a direct employee, um, this is even more extreme where you're not a direct employee and your job is literally, your contract is to pick somebody up and drop them off somewhere else. Um, some of the tools that um, kind of startups created to do this were things like, um, you know, you, if you're an independent contractor, you're supposed to be independent technically. But there's gray area and they kind of came up with these ways to motivate and incentivize people to do things without providing them a manager. So one of these things is like um, unpredictable pricing, for instance, or unpredictable wages. So an Uber driver, um, when they open their app, they see a, a map um, where it tells them where they should go uh, to make more money. So 
So they don't have a manager saying, you know, it would be great if you would go to take that, um, you know, area that's underserved right now. But they have this kind of price incentive. Or they'll get an email that says, like, hey, just so you know, this Saturday is a big event. Um, if you work on Saturday, you can, uh, you know, make $30 an hour. So work whenever you want. It's totally up to you. Freedom, yay, you're in your own business. Um, if you want to work on um, Tuesday, you're going to make $3 an hour. Uh, Saturday, $30 an hour, but totally up to you. Good luck. <laughs> um, another version of this is kind of surveillance. So um, there's a freelance platform called Upwork. Um, if you get a job on Upwork uh, and somebody hires you at an hourly rate, they can watch a video of your screen uh, during the time that you were working for them to make sure you didn't check your personal email. So congratulations, you have your own business, you can work however you want. Um, just make sure that it's every action that you do is something we want your employer to observe. Um, this also makes hiring really quick. Um, things that you would never be able to hire a freelancer for because it's just totally impractical, like go grab all these scooters hanging around Detroit and charge them. Um, at three o'clock this Friday, you're not gonna put a classified ad in a newspaper, but you can send a ping through a phone that says uh, whoever's in the area, come and do this. Um, so I think that and it, it's not just the apps. The apps are what we talked about, but these are management strategies. It's not a sector of companies that we talk about. Um, I mean, they, they have a sector of companies we talk about. We talk about the Silicon Valley version. But like these are management strategies that can be copied by mainstream other companies that aren't Silicon Valley, even if Silicon Valley is, um, as Lewis mentioned, kind of the stage where the new like work trend, what was the phrase you used? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> Blueprints of the future. The blueprint of the future. The, yeah. <laughs> um, so now there are versions of this which hemp agencies are basically doing this. Um, a warehouse. You know, a restaurant can send out a bat signal similar to Uber and find somebody to fill a shift within three minutes. You know, before maybe you went to an agency to find people and it took days or weeks to fill it. So it's just, you know, being able to use kind of this kind of labor in more and more situations. Um, and the impact of this is different for different people. Um, I'll tell you about kind of two of the stories in my book. Uh, one of them, um, which is the story that if you're starting one of these companies uh, that uses this labor, you will tell no matter uh, if your company washes cars or dishes or um, cleans houses or does software programming or whatever. Everybody tells this version of the gig economy story, uh, which is this young man who I met um, who had just graduated from college with a computer science degree. So young, extremely in demand skill, Hates his job, is very bored, um, spends half the day watching people play video games on the internet, which is apparently a thing um, at his desk. And so he quits if he's frustrated. He joins this startup um, called Gigster, which is uh, kind of like Uber for software programmers. Um, you can sit back and like projects come to you. Um, and you can do them without building a business or going and finding clients or doing all the things you would normally have to do to build a small business. Um, and so he made $12,000 his first month. He loved it, you know, could go to the gym in the middle of the day, plan vacations whenever he wanted. And that's really the story that's sold as how this would work out for everybody. Um, but, you know, Curtis, before he quit, he had a year's worth of living expenses um, he had gone and bought health insurance. He would hired an accountant who told him how much money to save for his taxes, which would be higher as an independent contractor. So he kind of built this social safety net for himself that he wouldn't have access to as an independent contractor, um, the, the like social safety net that we all have. Um, so on the other hand, um, one of the women who I followed in my book, uh, she worked on Amazon Mechanical Turk. Um, does anybody know what Amazon Mechanical Turk is? Yeah, yeah it's yes. kind of a niche thing. Um, but basically, Amazon has this platform where it's much the same as like the hidden workforce, where you think that things are happening via technology, but often it's human intelligence. So it's this platform where companies can post lots of little tasks, and they might do something as small as write a description for this <coughs> e-commerce site. Or one time a startup told me that they had um, made a magic app where you could take a picture of a food and it would automatically identify it and send you back how many calories you were in it, or, or were in it with their proprietary algorithm. Uh, the proprietary algorithm was it made a post on Mechanical Turk labeled 
extremely entrepreneurial things that I don't know if I would have thought of, um, and I don't know if the guy who started Amazon Mechanical Turk could have thought of, but she worked at us and she made $40,000 a year, five cents at a time. Her husband had lost her job, his job. Um, she had never worked outside the home before, so she didn't feel like she could go get a restaurant job or another job that required experience. Um, but she did things like set up alarms, so if certain tasks were posted, her computer would have like a siren, like this is a task where you can make money at it. And she would sleep in her office, and if the siren went off, she would like jump up and do these little like clicky things. So um, then you're thinking like, okay, it's great that there's this opportunity for her to do that, and that she figured it out and made ends meet, but can we really feel good about this? Um, when she got hurt, because she was spending so much time at a keyboard, and she had carpal tunnel, and all of these, you know, no workers compensation, couldn't take a sick day or rest, couldn't um, go and have the surgery that would fix it, because she couldn't afford the medication. Like, so there are real structural problems with these things. Um, I think there are new ways that companies are structuring them and taking advantage of like the structure that we have that <coughs> never kind of thought about it, um, how jobs might be broken down to labeling one photo. Um, and, you know, as kind of Lewis said, um, it's not kind of inevitable that we structure ourselves this way. Um, this work has some potential, like the idea that you would have a flexible job is pretty compelling. Um, it's just we don't have any of the structures to support it. Um, and I also kind of in the book talk about some solutions that people have for fixing that problem. Um, and I'm hoping that we can talk about some of those in our conversation. Uh, thank you. Okay, thank you both. Uh, first question may be an easy one. Uh, what motivated you to write these books, and uh, what was the most surprising thing you learned? Um, yeah, you breathe um, yeah, so I, I'm a historian, so you know I had written two books on the history of personal debt, which if you think this is a depressing topic. <laughs> um, so I wrote about that, and at, you know a lot of that story is the story of income inequality, you know, which I think we talk a lot about now, at least in the one certain set of us, but also income volatility, which we talk a lot less about, um, about the way in which work has become so unstable and insecure. And of course, I, I just wanted to write a history that I thought would help explicate the present, uh, which is surprisingly unfashionable among historians. Um, but uh, I think it's, you know, for me anyway, I, I wanted to tell a story that told the history of work, but also the history of business um, at the same time, and tell those two stories together, because oftentimes business history and labor history don't really speak to one another. And so, and we have lots of histories about the fault of that older world, that world of stability. We have very few histories that tell us what replaced it, so where our work lives came from. And if you are a young person today reading labor history, none of it seems real to you. None of it seems relevant. None of it speaks to you about this world of strong unions and stable jobs and having a job for a long time and working in a workplace with other people that also live in your neighborhood. This is completely alien. And so I wanted to tell the story of what work was like now and help people hopefully try to imagine how we take the best of that old world <coughs> and bring it to the present day. And I think that's, for me anyway, that's the trick. Because I, I am very entranced by this idea of not having a boss and being an independent worker and having flexibility, but that doesn't, it's not progress if it means I can't, I can't take care of my kids and I can't count on rent and that kind of life of fear. That's not what progress looks like. So this is, for me anyway, this is a very old American dream and going back to, the Homestead Act to the idea of people having their own farms and being independent of the land, which totally failed, by the way. Um, you know, <laughs> so not just for the millions of Native Americans that were murdered, but also for the farmers that replaced them, um, who found their profits sucked off by mortgage bankers and uh, railroads and other things like that. So for me, this is this is where the, the story come from, came from, and I'm you know, excited that it finally is done, and I can think less than this. <laughs> was there anything that was surprising? Um, I was surprised by how pro 
independent work I became by the end. The, I was surprised by how I had expected to tell this real story of decline. And what the story I felt like I ended up telling was a story of decline, but something else coming out of it. Where you could easily tell that, and it reminded me of the stories people told of the rise of industrialization, which is a story of decline. You go from a country, um, for you know, white people at least, of sort of small shops and businesses and farming to a world where you're enthralled to a boss, which was considered to be unfree, where you have to go to a place and obey your boss all day and get paid a check. And the struggle over wage labor is the story of the 19th century. But we're also nostalgic for that now because we live in this other world. So, you know, I think it forced me to think in a more complicated fashion about this, which is the point of reading history, I think, to complicate the story. Sarah? Um, yeah, I think kind of when this buzzword, the gig economy, whatever it means, came up, there emerged two narratives, and one of them was, this is the greatest thing that ever happened, we're all gonna be our own businesses, which we talked about a little bit, and the other one was like, we're all gonna die, and we're gonna be working in sweatshops tomorrow, so give up. Um, and I think the reality was a lot, it's a lot more complicated than that, and it's different for different people. Um, and I also wanted to kind of orient so I wanted to show like multiple ways that this plays out and how it is different for different people and how neither of those narratives is true. And I also wanted to orient it in kind of this larger story um, and make the point similarly that like the independent work is not bad, but that like, structures need to change around it in order to support it. And big surprise for you? Big surprise for me was how big it got. Um, when I started thinking about telling this story, the Silicon Valley trend, um, just how much is how much you can talk about that's relevant to the, uh, or how much is relevant to that story. Like you can talk about the history of work, and you can talk about this longer trend of risk transfer. Um, so just the the universe of the story expanding kind of surprised me a little bit. Okay, um, Lewis, a, a question for you. You, you pointed out that, that we'd be calling this holy grail of the full-time job with benefits mostly existed for middle-class white married men. Um, and that even for many of them, it was uh, backbreaking and soulless work perhaps, but that's still what we're nostalgic for right now. Uh, do, do you, why do you think that now there is just so much more interest in um, Sorry, I lost my train of thought. Um, now that it seems to be changing for everybody, including these white middle class men, is that what's driving this concern about the, 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 the unstable work of the gig economy? Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think nobody cares until it happens to white men. Um, and uh, I think that we, and most of us still have soul breaking, tedious jobs, you know, whether. You're, not at the Eldrick Center. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, a lot of the jobs people have are not like these, like, you know, if you're in policy circles with people who all went to, to Yale, they're like, work is great. I'm so fulfilled. It's like, that's not what work is like for most people. Most people are answering phones or making coffee or filling out forms, right? Even a good job is still filling out forms. Um, and nobody wants to do that. They'd all rather be playing with their kids or taking, well, maybe not taking care of their parents, but they have to take care of their parents, you know, um, or, you know, in a lot of ways, it's not, it's not treating us like beasts of burden, but it's still not fully human, right? And I think one of the hard things to realize is that you know, this is the promise of automation, to liberate us into being more fully human, to give us the time and space uh, to be curious and creative and caring. You know, not all of us are be rocket scientists. I don't want to be a rocket scientist. I certainly don't want to program computers. Um, I hate that. But the but I can imagine a world where many of us care for one another and have these more human kinds of relationships. And that is the story. It's why we're not all out right now threshing wheat in the fields because we have had automation in the past called the mechanical thresher that allows this to happen. Right? The agricultural workforce in America is the most auto, it's the most automated sector. Right? So. I think that there is this promise, but it's a promise that is right now very unevenly distributed. You know, for some people, this works out fabulously. I mean, they're just crushing it, as the kids say. And uh, 
this is not true for lots of people as well. And so there's this very unequal experience of what this freelance economy means, as, as Sarah points out so well in her book, and it's very, everyone should buy that book. You should buy my book if you want to, you know, hold the door open. But gig, it's a book. You can enjoy reading. You should buy But, but it, yeah, I think, I think that's, I think that's, that's the thing. It's like, what do we want work to be? Do we want, what is perfect? But labor, labor, uh, as we had it in the post-war, I think is a historical moment, industrial labor. But I think work is an enduring human condition. And the idea we all want is we all want to have purposeful activity in this world, right? And whether it's connected to a job, a permanent job or not, I think is, is the question. Like, how do we make that happen? Or we're getting, sorry. No, it's good. No, it's, yeah. I, I know exactly how we'll make that happen. idea that benefits were given by well-meaning technocrats in the government and benefits were given by well-intentioned business people and that's not true that's not what happened benefits were demanded by working people who organized themselves in ways that weren't about kumbaya <laughs> that weren't about kumbaya but they shut it down they shut the system down at the end of the book I wrote about what labor can learn from Uber. And Uber broke all the laws. Uber didn't care about whether it was right or wrong and a bunch of lawyers telling them what they could or couldn't do. Uber just went in and did it, and then he made it legal by power, and by organizing. And that's what the UAW did in 1936 when they shut down General Motors. They stood up to the largest corporation in the world, and they brought it down and then they made sure that it was still strong afterwards and they got a fair share of that. And that's the story of labor in America, the story of working people being smart about breaking the supply chains. They didn't strike everywhere at every GM plant. They struck at one plant where they made the bodies for one kind of car and they broke the whole supply <coughs> chain. That's why it worked. And on the back of that, the entire post-war labor system was built. And right now, Amazon's not afraid of its warehouse workers. All those logistical workers, whether they're Grubhub delivery people, or Uber drivers, or warehouse workers, right now they're not afraid. And it may take a new kind of labor movement to organize them, just like the CIO did in the 1930s. They broke away from the AFL, if you want to get into the alphabet soup of labor history. But the AFL-CIO broke apart because the CIO wanted to organize the unorganizable. They wanted
wanted to organize the unskilled, semi-skilled workers of these plants. And the AFL just wanted to organize carpenters and bricklayers, as they always had. And they had sort of puttered along through the 20s. They had mostly been broken, but they kind of existed. And then the CIA did its thing. Not until 1955, until everybody was dead. <laughs> that had to be part of it, uh, did they come back together. But this is part of the story, you know, and what does that look like now? What does the workers' voice look like in the 21st century? What does it look like in a distributed economy? We still don't know. Sorry, Sarah. Oh, yeah. So in my book, I call out a couple people who are trying to figure that out. Yeah. Um, and there are a lot it's of reasons. Great Thank segment. you for saying I love to set up. Also by Lewis's book. <laughs> um, so in the book, I follow a few people who are working on that problem. Um, or are trying to make that happen themselves, and it became clear kind of the need for like a new way to do that. Um, for one, if you're an independent contractor, you have no federally protected right to unionize, so or to collective action. Um, you're treated like your small businesses colluding. Um, so, for instance, Christy, who I told you about, who works on Amazon Mechanical Turk, that weird, um, you know, fake technology that's actually human intelligence platform. Um, they got together and they um, uh, they created kind of this hub, digital hub where they were going to plan kind of what to do in order to improve their conditions, how they would reach Amazon. Um, and their solution was, uh, you know, they wanted to make sure that only people who worked on the platform could join. So they put a task on Mechanical Turk that said, you can only get this task if you've done so much work on Mechanical Turk, <coughs> but you get this code and then you can sign up for our sort of union thing and then we'll plan things together. So it starts gaining traction, and then they get an email from Amazon. This task violates their terms of service. Oh, okay, so um, there's nothing, you know, if that were something that was done to employees who were organizing, there'd be a way to fight, the, fight that in a legal sense, because you can't interfere, but with independent contractors, um, it kind of kills the, the thing. Um, if you think about um, some people are working on these platforms, you know, in a factory, you go to work the same place every day, you see people, you know who they are, you probably speak the same language, you live in the same place. In some of these platforms, that's not true at all. Um, you don't know who your coworkers are. So in, in New York City, Uber has like a sort of union thing, but in order to form it, they had to like make a deal with Uber, and then Uber gave them a list of drivers. Um, so that's not quite the same thing. Um, otherwise, you're driving around, as one of the people who I follow my book does, with a megaphone, yelling, don't drive for Uber, we're striking. Um, and that's how you are trying to reach people. Um, so there's a lot of ways in which kind of those things be rethought. <laughs> okay. I have a lot more questions, but um, I will open it up now to the audience. And um, is, I don't know, if, if, Rob, do we have a mic or we have yeah. uh, people running around? Yeah. Um, I, while Rob is getting the mic and we're about to select the first questioner, I will say, do get those books. Seriously, they're good. Um, and she was talking about Christy. She has a very surprising end to her story, so I'm not going to give it away. But you have to get it to uh, find out what happens to Christy. So with that, who wants to ask? She's, she's alive, she's fine. She's alive, she's alive. It's just it's terrific, it's, a, it's part of the, one of the gripping stories. No, it's good, it's good. Okay. How you doing? The uh, question goes to the panel. Who's and what did you, you want to tell us who you are? Oh, uh, Robert Brad Benson. Um, what do you need to know? <laughs> <laughs> okay, um, my question goes to the panel. Well, companies like um, Amazon and Walmart who pretty much have you know, gig economy type of employees on the front end, but yet do not make enough money on the back end so they can get subsidized from the state. How, do they, how are they able to get away with that? Sarah? Wait, uh, how, they're not making enough money, but they're making <coughs> if they, right. right, if they're making, say, um, I, I think both of them have raised their uh, minimum wage to $15, which still, um, allows them to collect, you know, um, subsidy benefits. So a particular state that uh, they're working at, they're working for a multinational billion, billion dollar company on the front end that is making gazillions of dollars, and yet those states are paying for those workers on the back end with welfare, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to work so this company can make all this money. 
And I'm just trying to figure out how are they able to play on both sides of the streets? Why, why is Walmart able to subsidize? Well, there was very famously a guideline let out by McDonald's on how to apply for you know, um, food subsidies for its employees. Right. You know, uh, sort of guidelines like, oh, you don't make enough working here, here's what you get. Yeah, I mean, the question is why are people working there? If this is, you know, what kinds of alternatives do they have? Right, and the sort of collapse of those alternatives. Um, and, you know, I think right now there's a sense that we should pass a law to do that rather than empower workers to fight back. And so there were a lot of fast food restaurant organizers that's been quite successful, actually, uh, more successful than you might imagine, um, to push back on that. But it's hard to organize Walmart. Whenever you try to organize Walmart, right, you, you try to uh, organize each of these individual. I talked with the people from the AFL about the Walmart organizing campaign. And they're like, well, what do we do? And I was like, oh, I was like, nobody ever asked you what I think. So I was like, yeah, I'm excited. Here's what you do. You have 16,000 stores in America or whatever. You have you know, three or 500 Chinese factories. And in the middle, you have like two ports. This is a few years ago. Uh, you know, and you know, all the stuff has to go, well, just shut the ports down. That's what they would have done in the 30s. They would have shut the ports down. It's before that the big Panamax ships came in, where they, you know, they recently expanded the Panama Canal. So you got these giant ships come in the size of the uh, Empire State Building. Well, there's only two natural ports on the East Coast that can take that. Uh, Baltimore and, uh, where was the other one? It wasn't even New York, I think it was. Yeah, it is now. It is now, they just yeah. changed it, right? They, they, it was before Lincoln, they, could, they Lincoln, did all the Bay stuff to adjust it. I was like, well, there's only two ports. So we can shut down, I'm from Baltimore, I'm like, we got this, we're good to go. <laughs> like, we're a bunch of angry people in Baltimore. Um, so I was like, we can do this, just bring out the American Federation of Teachers and Longshoremen and no one's gonna shoot Mrs. Cavapo, right? Um, and they're like, no, that's illegal, we can't do it. I'm like, okay, it's illegal, you can't do it. Guess where we make some laws in this country? Guess why laws exist like that? So this is a... Uh, Sort of what I, I would say to that. So why, who makes the laws that say this is what companies can and can't do? Why, who workers can and can't organize in this particular way? You know, and I think that's one of the questions you need to ask. And everyone's being really uncomfortable with my anti-law position right now. I apologize. Um, Bring it on. No, but the, uh, I'm not sure what do you think, Sarah? So why can why can why can Walmart do this? Because we let them. Because we let them. <laughs> I think we let them. That's the answer. Yeah, yeah, I think that's. Apparently, that's what we want. So, uh, Andy O'Hearn, a uh, quick two-part question. The first one goes uh, to you, uh, Lewis, uh, has to do with, is the, you know, the last century was pretty much the rise of the corporations by almost all accounts. Are things headed back towards a so-called yield economy, which was the beginning of, I guess, the last century? That's the part one. The part two might go to either one of you, but uh, it's more, like, there was a point made about uh, that you can't really unionize all these wonderful one-third of the contract workers. But I know there's something called Freelancers Union, that aptly, uh, you know, called FU, I guess. And, uh, <laughs> and I wonder if there's gonna be something like that in the offing, potentially, where all these contract workers, by hook or by crook, uh, kind of say, you know, if we band together, we might have some power here. Yeah. Yeah. Should we go first, or? Well, I need to take the first question. Okay, okay, okay. sounds good. That was, that was fun. <laughs> um, yeah, no, I think that, I mean, in the book, what I would say is, like, what's surprising me is not High like machines that make us more productive, which I think is a long history. Right. What's amazing to me is that individuals or small groups of people can access a global market as producers, as buyers, you know, as consumers, you know, every which way, as learners, like you can participate in a global economy as an individual, right? And you, you know, I think people talk a lot about Amazon, and this is where I get positive for a second, so bear with me. But we talk about Etsy. You know, people are less into Etsy because I'm pretty sure because it's for women. Um, so there's less talk about it, and it's, it's devalued because it's women. But it's it's a platform that makes billions of dollars a year. There's 500,000 people who live full time off of Etsy, making products. Um, it's that's my wake up alarm too. Um, so that's I was like I was like I'm awake. Um, so that was like 500,000. So they, it's 80% women, mostly rural, you know, and this is like an incredible thing. And so like they are making, you know, but they're acting as individuals in the world through this platform. So who controls the platform, I think is the question. Um, the other thing with the freelancers union or FU, they don't like it when you say FLU because I'm very square, I say FLU. Um, yeah, I mean, this is the question. Can people, can people organize? I mean, can people, how do people organize in this economy? So 
Uh, one reason I think people pay more attention to Uber than SC is because Uber is the has the highest valuation of any private company in the world, and is just this total anomaly in the amount of money that it's absorbed from every source, including like Saudi Arabia. Like, it's an incredible, like, weird thing. Um, not that Etsy isn't also very weird. Um, <laughs> uh, in terms of the Freelancers Union, I once sat through a presentation of the branding and marketing agency for the platform Fiverr, yeah. and it turns out they also created the Freelancers Union brand. Um, it started as an insurance company, and it's not a union. Um, it can't be, like, it's, it's morphed into several different things, but it doesn't have the rights that a union does. Mm -hmm. But it does provide an opportunity for freelancers to get to get together. They just started a yeah. hub. Yeah, they um, actually yeah. they used to sell they used to sell group insurance to freelancers. Yeah. Freelancers could be group. Mm -hmm. um, when the ACA was implemented, it made that illegal essentially, so they couldn't do that anymore, and they had to change the law. But there's also like lots of cool new experiments in workers' voice. There's coworker to org. You know, which is uh, organized Starbucks workers. There's lots of interesting things. Um, that are, are going on experiments and new ways to help people connect. Okay, I think we have a question here, and I know we have a, a few other questions. Oh, right okay. 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 We actually have a queue of people with questions, so we'll get into everybody. <laughs> We're good, though. We're good. Okay. Hi, Renee Piaz with the Anti Poverty Network of New Jersey. Um, it seems to be that just over the last several decades, we've moved towards corporations, and then it's trickled down to smaller businesses of devaluing workers altogether, um, you know, with stagnating wages since the early 70s, and, you know, um, not only suppressing wages, but then reducing benefits decade by decade, right? To now where we have Canadian temp workers who don't get any benefits, typically. And I think this also goes back to the question, first question about Walmart, too, right? Um, what do you, what policy changes or other changes do you think have occurred in the last few decades to create that? This order <laughs> um, I think, yeah, so I think the, at least I argue that it starts not with the state or with the corporation. It goes with uh, a crisis in the late 1960s. In the 1960s, as corporations made so much money, they began to diversify into unrelated fields that have nothing to do with it. So if you lived through the 60s and were not high, you might remember this. The, so the, it was uh, the conglomerates. And basically, this is what happened to the entire Fortune 500. But then it all fell apart. And the aftermath of the 70s, 80s, and 90s is the story of the breakup of all, the reorganization of all these corporations. You know, some of them survived and seem to be okay, like General Electric. And other ones you've never heard of. Yes, yeah, not for the workers, for the, for the company. Yeah, no, no. This is when that happens. Um, as they burn all the profits of the post-war in this, like, frantic financialization grab. Um, other companies you haven't heard of, like Ling Temco Bao, which at one time was one of the largest corporations in America, um, disappears utterly, right? So these things are partially about policies. It's about, you know, ERISA, OSHA, certain kinds of lines being drawn here and there. But what really matters is the way in which corporations imagine themselves in the world, focused on the short-term instead of the long-term, focus on shareholders versus multiple stakeholders, focusing the way they're valued by Wall Street shifts um, into something called the, you know, there's different kinds of valuation schemes that matter, the rise of venture capital as a venture. There's a lot of different things to go into it, um, which this yellow book talks about. The, um, <laughs> but I think the main thrust available at your nearest bookseller, they, the main thrust of it is that there's, there's a real shift in mentality by business leaders about how you survive, how you succeed. I mean, for me, one of the things that changes, most important changes I, I like to talk about is the changes in the tax code, the people who manage these things. So um, in the 1950s, the top marginal tax brackets, we're all cool with tax brackets. It's like the place where the tax code, the tax percentage changes. In the 1950s, the equivalent today, the top one was $2 million, which is a tax bracket we don't have anymore. You made more than $2 million a year, 93% of your marginal income was taken away. Hmm. So we're nostalgic for the 50s. <laughs> we don't talk about that. 
We don't talk about the way in which we get tax brackets that really ramped it up. So the people who ran and made all our money, made all the money, had no incentive to do crazy shenanigans. They had no incentive, they could not make a lot of money doing those crazy shenanigans like they had done in the Gilded Age, the 1920s, and the 19 teens, and it was always taken away. So this is one of the things I think we should think about. It's like, look, yeah, let's tax, let's even be really generous. Let's put in $5 million a year. You make more than $5 million a year, we start taxing you out out the wazoo. So this is one of the things that is different. Um, but I think it's important to realize it's not just about laws, it's not just about the government, it's about business leaders and the values and how they, were, how they think of themselves in this world. And that really does change. It really changes. And you can see an immense difference, as I write about this, we mentioned when we were talking about General Electric, between the head of General Electric in the 1950s and the head of General Electric in the 60s and 70s. It goes from being a place that's proud of making American stuff, whose growth curve is the growth of electricity, to being something that just makes debt you know, by the 1980s. And this is a profound shift uh, in that. Did you want to weigh in on that one, or should I move on to this <laughs> question? OK. Not as long as you're right. I thank you both for the presentations, and um, Lily and Ms. Barbara Rockley. And my question is, um, for both of you, what were the traits that you saw in people who were successful, the most successful, in the in sort of gig economy? Like what were the prominent traits, I'm sure there are many, but the prominent ones of the people that you saw that were really crushing it, as you say? You gotta do the hand gesture. <laughs> I think Sarah, you should take that one. Yeah. Um, I mean, the, the, the biggest thing is having like an in-demand, highly paid skill, which is, you know, everybody has, but then um, the people who figure it out from there it's almost um, a lot of these platforms, the mentality is almost like you're playing a, a game, like you have this algorithm, like you have an algorithm managing you and you figure out how the algorithm works and you play against it. And the people who um, kind of have the best uh, understanding of the rules of the game um, and were proactive, I guess, in figuring them out and trying to beat them um, were the people who fared best. I think also for me, one of the counterintuitive findings of some of the survey data is that older people do better. That, that you think of it as a young person's game, but older people have a lifetime of skills, and if they can figure out how to take those skills and put them online and work in a different way, they can be quite successful. Um, and it's, it's hard to do, but you know, they're, they're, there's all kinds of survey data that supports that. So I don't know how we help older, mid-career and older individuals to, to recognize that and uh, to, to, you know, to support them in that, because we certainly have a lot of people who just feel that's not for them, and we, we, we need to find a way to support them with our workforce development policies. And I know we've got a team from the Labor Department in the back there, but <laughs> we're not going to call you out right now. So uh, who is next, Rob? Yeah, we have uh, two questions on this side. Yeah. Well, three. Okay. My name is Homi Asafa Tehran Ahmed. I'm a Rutgers graduate, history major. So I am a, I was a history major as well, so I was a, I am a, I consider myself, a, besides what I do in workforce development, I consider myself an amateur uh, a, 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 a historian. <laughs> uh, fascinated still with that field. Um, so historically, um, we found ourselves in, in a very privileged position in between the two wars, and particularly after World War II. Uh, we're basically the providers of the world, while all the other countries were getting their act together. The third world were in, you know, uh, trying to import substitution, so they were importing a lot from us, and uh, it was an ideal and privileged and, and exclusive uh, historical moment. Uh, obviously that changed. Uh, uh, competition become rougher, and I still it is even more with this globalization, uh, the rise of not only Europe in the old days, but also now of, of Japan later on, China, and so India, and so forth. So how much of a role did that process made, uh, had in, in the breakdown of the quality of our labor? And in terms of the quality, not in terms of the skill, but in terms of the, 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 the life standards and, and, and the, the, the possibilities. 
possibilities that I make for life, the quality of life of our labor force, um, we don't have today. I think it's a really great question, right? Because I think for a long time, when certainly if you grew up in the 80s like I did, you thought that any kind of downturn in the economy like the 70s was an aberration. We go back to this older world. And we kept waiting and waiting and waiting for that to come back. And then it just never did. Um, and so historians now refer to this as the great exception. This is certainly a line of argument, that this is a moment where the world is blown up, America is the only power left standing, and they make a lot of money um, rebuilding the world. And that's sort of true, um, I think. Uh, I think we became very arrogant and complacent. So as, for instance, in the steel industry, as, as Japan was rebuilding and Europe was rebuilding, they rebuilt with new high-end electric furnaces that we didn't build, we didn't have. Uh, we didn't modernize our technology really ever. It just basically just got subsumed by new kinds of steel manufacturing techniques in the 1980s called the mini mill. Um, and this is just one example of the American arrogance not to reinvest in itself, which is what happened. People, the, the executives built golf courses, the working people went fishing, um, you know, this kind of thing. And it was a moment where we should have done that. And we forgot, we thought what, we, what was made by policies and people in the 1930s and 40s to invest in high technology, like the aerospace industry, which went from being um, a small niche thing in the mid-1930s, and few more people worked in candy manufacturing in 1935 than in building aircraft. In a few years later, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 it's the largest industry in America. Uh, and it's done through an agency in the government called the Reconstruction Finance Corporation that takes all the idle capital of Wall Street that's sitting there, scared money don't make none, and then finds a way to get it into the hands of entrepreneurs and build those that account. By 1965, you could read anything you want. Oh, this is the future of capitalism. This is just how capitalism works. This is how free enterprise works. This is just, it's like, no, 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 we made this. We made these businesses boom. We made it boom for lots of people. Um, and there's this amnesia that it's about this active process. And so we kept waiting for the natural process to come back, and it never did. So while the rest of the world rebuilt itself, you know, and I think, I, I do think it's important to think about globalization as part of this, but not in a negative way. I think everybody counts, whether you're in America or not in America, and we can build all this up together. Um, but I do think we need to invest our money. Right now, we have two and a half trillion dollars in excess capital in our banking system. You know, it's a reserve requirement, and there's money on top of that. There's two and a half trillion dollars just sitting there. It can't, it's not invested, it's not doing anything. And we're back where we were. We're in this place where there's so much money being made at the top, that, but it's not going to the regular folks, and it's also not being, you know, if one thing if it was invested in businesses that would employ us, well, it's not doing that either. And so we're again in this moment, we're not thinking we have to be active here, and it's, it's a problem. So that's my response to this sort of great exception argument. It's a great exception in the so far as they, they just coasted for about 30 years and let it till it all fell apart. Okay, um, there was a, another question here. Oh, I'm sorry, Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, my name is Brian Kulas and I'm part of the Garden State Years Program. And um, my question is kind of a three-parter, so uh, I'll kind of connect the dots a little bit on, so you don't understand. My first, I, I guess the theme of it is, where do you go when you're disposable? Um, a disposable employee. Uh, we brought up Walmart, and I had worked at Walmart for close to a year. <clears throat> Showed up, did everything, worked through my breaks, worked through my lunch, eight hours, I just didn't care. But I thought that I was doing the right thing. I thought I was going somewhere at $7 an hour. And, you know, of course, my, um, my assistant manager would always pitch me, you know, you've got manager potential if you stick around with us. So I just decided to keep working through my breaks. And um, then I got sick, I was hospitalized for two weeks, came back, I was fired. So I guess the irony to that story is about 20 years later, I get this letter in the mail, and it's actually some kind of semi-paycheck of $82.50, and it says here's your portion of the settlement that was a Walmart 
um, you know, class action where you work through that period of time, and I'm thinking, okay, I guess I got some money back, you know, but I realized in that moment how disposable I was. So one question I have is, with these companies having these large settlements of labor disputes, which happen again and again, that you don't even read about, you just kind of get a check in the mail, do you think if companies were held a little bit more responsible than just being able to say, okay, we're gonna, you know, um, pay $5 million, which is gonna be spread over 200,000 employees, everyone gets 20 bucks. Um, I guess that's my first question. And my second question about being disposable is I'm currently a caterer. And you have multiple options. As a caterer, you can work almost as an independent contractor if you, work, if you choose to work for a temp agency. The issues with that is nothing's covered, and usually the first requirement is you're gonna need to spend $350 on your uniform. Jacket, tie, vest, um, you have to pay for your own parking when it's at a hotel and the only parking is a parking garage. So you get paid a little bit more, but you end up losing 10 times more. Um, on the other hand, on the flip side, you know, you could work for $10 an hour, you could try to find a union in Atlantic City, but what I've come to the determination is there's only two things outside of the union that give you credibility to keep your job as a banquet server. One, are you willing to offer Friday, Saturday, and Sunday for the rest of your life? And two, it's not how much you can carry, it's does your boss, would your boss be willing to vouch for you that you would never drop a tray of 10 dishes? So my last part is finishing up, going on to the question of where do you go when you're disposable. One time I got a job as a temp agency. I went there, I was just a warehouse, I was willing to take anything I could get. I think it was $10 an hour. I was put on the bottom floor, just uh, putting the unloading boxes and putting them together. A uh, manager who was white comes up to me and says, you don't belong down here. And I'm like, what? And he says, you're what? You don't belong down here. So basically he says, you belong doing forklift work. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not gonna argue race, I'm, I'm just, I just wanna get paid. You know, so I'm not gonna sit here and argue race, all these things, I'm not gonna, I just wanna do, I don't wanna cross any arguments. So he goes, you know, drive the forklift. I said, I've never done that before in my life. I don't have certification, anything. He's like, look, we have one rule. If, you, if you're if you using the forklift and you drop something, you have to pay for whatever's on the pallet. <laughs> well, at that point, I was just like, I had nothing to say. I went back to the temp agency, made my complaints. They told me that I should find another temp agency. So where do you go when you're disposable? Where do you go when you're constantly just flip flopping jobs? Today I'm gonna work in a warehouse, today I'm gonna do banquet work, or I'm gonna do banquet work here. Where do you go? I mean, I, I guess that's my overall question. And, and going back, do you think that if companies were held just a little bit more liable to like just, you know, $5 million spread over, you know, a thousand people, do you think that would make a difference? Sorry. Thank you for your time, by the way. Microsoft um, employed all these independent contractors for years, they fought it, yada yada, and they ended up paying something like $97 million, which was like, I, forget, I could pick it up and look up the number, but it was some small rounding error on their annual profits, and they don't, it's like the cost of doing business for these big firms, like they don't care, about $5 million, $100 million, they have a labor relations system to keep people afraid and disposable and cheap, that's all they really care about. So, I mean, for me, I think the best way to do it is change the laws so that we don't hold the companies accountable in money, we hold the executives accountable in jail. Because um, I think things would change very rapidly if the CEOs went to jail every time this kind of stuff happened. And right now, we don't do that, right? This is what was so shocking about the Enron case, is that people actually went to jail, uh, at least some of them. But 
you know, we don't talk about that enough. And I think that's, I think holding people accountable, or at least giving us a cut of the money, right? So every time these big companies have an IPO or make X billion dollars, well, just give us the money too. Give us a share. If you're gonna impose this on us or take advantage of our legal system and our shared history of good governance. Okay, we, we have a question over here and then back. Thank you. Is this on? Yeah, thank you. So I'd, I'd like to mention along the lines of some of the things that have been talked about, uh, a book which I found very inspiring called No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in the Gilded Age by Jane F. McAlevey, M-C-A-L-E-V-E-Y. Um, so um, it's quite an inspiring reading. It's about new uh, unionizing efforts in the United States today. I see the heads nodding. So I work in technology and um, I'm a member of the New Start Career Network and I invited a friend to come today but he wasn't able to make it. He has a doctorate, he's in his 50s. He was working at home on an hourly basis teaching children overseas English via the internet for some low ungodly wage and nowadays instead of doing that because he would like to get back to work full time he's working a second shift or a third shift instead at an Amazon fulfillment center all for the purpose of leaving his days free so that during the day he might be able to do some networking and perhaps get a job interview. So I don't think he's alone, but for those of us in the room who have a full-time permanent job, you know, there's different levels of granularity for the design of these systems. It's not just design at the screen level. It's not just design at the application level. Not just design at the organization level to also design at the ecosystem level, how all the organizations fit together and talk to each other. And it is it does have to do with power, and it does have to do with policy. So if you think that this is not going to eventually affect you, I'm here to tell you it's going to. So uh, I, I'd like to invite comments from the authors, and I really appreciate your being here today. We have quite a few job seekers who end up um, taking shift work at Amazon. Um, I guess some others maybe in, in the room here with us. In, in part, Amazon's had a huge explosion in the number of jobs that they're hiring for in New Jersey. And uh, you know, we have people who have to make a decision. They need some income, maybe while they're looking for something better or different. Um, but you know, that's that's a choice that they they have to make. So. We, we hear that a lot. Not often somebody with a PhD, but um, yeah. In terms of how the things fit together, um, one interesting thing is that some data suggests that um, a lot of people who are working kind of in an independent contractor capacity are doing it in addition to a traditional job, um, which sort of uh, calls into question the quality of those jobs and unemployment is available right now. What do those jobs look like? You know, wages are stagnant, um, and I think that that's a part of the story too. We have two questions. Okay, okay. so first here on the right, on my right, right and on my left. Yeah, I'm going to say thank you to the Leah for organizing this. I'm also part of the New Start Career Group. I'm a volunteer career coach. I'm a baby boomer, and I want to address some questions. Thank you so much for what you wrote. Um, I work with a company um, that quote unquote talks about how to own the future. I work for a corporation. So my question is to do with literacy of educating people. And everybody knows we have this issue with people transitioning in their mind of how to go from a job to be an entrepreneur at 60. Young people maybe haven't been beat up so much. They have a little bit easier time, I think, to do that um, level of, of work 
in your mind, you know, that's, they're cut out to be an entrepreneur, many of them. So the knowledge, I think, of having a plan B, I think is what we need in this country. And I work for four corporations, as I said, and I, including someone who ran for president at one time. And I feel that never was it addressed to make sure we're gonna be okay in case this economy changed the way it did. And so if you have you know, any input into that, I, I think it's very important that something is started that allows people to feel that there is hope for them to be trained in this capacity. And, and again, I was excited to see the American dream. It is dead for a lot of people. I interview people. And so my biggest fear is when they come in and they want money, they need immediate money. How can we help them quickly and then transition into that mindset of this new economy? I think the cultural shift is gonna be harder than the technological shift. And it's gonna be more profound. <clears throat> How do you go from a lifetime of being told to sit at a desk and listen to the teacher fill out the homework, turn the homework in to a world where you're told to manage your own time, right? Uh, to think for yourself. And our educational system is still not doing that, right? It's still not, you know, and people don't want it. Lots of people don't even want it. My students don't want it. I teach at a fancy school. And I have students that come up to me and they say, oh, Professor Hyman, what's in the exam? And I'm like, oh, I'm gonna ask you questions about you know, what we've been talking about. <laughs> and it's gonna be big, high-level questions about you know, the meaning of this over time. Like, like you asked me about you know, the meaning of the post-war period. You know, that's a good question. I'm glad ATA history major asked me. They say, well, what do I memorize? And I'm like, what are you talking about? They're like, well, what's the list of things I memorize so I can get an A plus in this class? And I was like, hey, why are you memorizing things? Be like, if, if it's just about, look, you can look it up on Wikipedia, right? It's about interpretation, perspective, you know, uh, being valuable in your thinking capacity. And anything that's in a textbook to, that has a textbook solution, well, a machine's gonna do that in the future. So what do you even want? Why are you at Cornell University? They don't like that answer. It's <laughs> not, they wanna know what it is to check the box. And the truth is, the boxes that are clear and can be checked will be checked by machines. Um, for a while, through disposable overseas labor, you know, by women in the Philippines and in India, but eventually by machine learning algorithms, right? So I think one of the things is this cultural mindset shift is actually quite difficult. Um, and it's much harder than simply, there's Upwork, here's Fiverr, here's Etsy, do the thing. What's wrong with you? And actually, I think women have a better time with this than men. I think women have never really felt a part of the workforce anyway. Certainly the women, the needs of women, particularly um, mothers, um, have never been considered as legitimate within the world of work. And so, you know, given, and they've always had to figure out how to make things work, <coughs> balancing that second shift at home with the work shift at work. And so when I talk to a lot of older women, I find that, that they're making it work for themselves. When older men are just like, well, where, where's my, where's the thing I was told I was gonna get? Why don't I get what I want? It's like, dude, that's not how it works. <laughs> but it's part of the scary Oh, well, Alice, I wanted to address the like easier for younger people thing. Um, if you were to, if you look at the BLS data, like the most popular category for independent contractors is actually like 45. And I don't remember which way it goes. Um, and you know, this was mentioning a lot of older people do this. And I actually think it's um, promising for older people because one thing that this opens up it becoming easier to hire freelancers, people wanting to hire freelancers, um, is if you have a specific expertise that maybe you can't, you know, not a many companies need a full-time person, you can spread it out through a bunch of companies. Um, most people coming out of college don't have that sort of deep, specific expertise. Um, I also think, I was, <laughs> um, I was recently a very interesting uh, program where a man uh, presented a book that he called The 100 Year Life. And he said the alternate title for the book was 60 Year Career, but that sounded really like something people wouldn't be interested in. So he went with The 100 Year Life. And if you're going to have a 60 year long career, um, you know, maybe some of these like less than full-time nine to five at your desk jobs, like there's a phase of your career that works on that. Um, okay, we have a question here. Yeah. Hi, I'm Lisa Chanowski-Singer. I'm a volunteer with the Women's 
our career center. I also teach at university, so I appreciate giving us your comment. Because when a student comes in to me and says, how do I get an A in this class? And I always say, what is it you want to get out of this class? And how can you apply the learning? Yeah. So I have this real obsession about them applying the learning, not just rote or repeat. And they don't bribe you ever, either. I mean, they don't like, write me a check for 50 grand, I will give you an A. Zero <laughs> times. You, you really don't want that recorded. Yeah. <laughs>
they um, buy all the material, they you know can be fired for like missing a job, and then they take all the money they paid for the truck. All this really terrible stuff. Uh, USA Today does this big investigation <coughs> and exposes kind of all these terrible practices. And these poor drivers, they supply every big company, like you know, your Targets, your you know, Trader Joe's. Um, the reporter called all those companies, like to a T, all the statements look the same. They're like, this is very far removed from our company. Like this person was hired by a company that hired a small business that hired them. We have nothing to do with them and we have no responsibility. Um, in my book, I followed one man who, uh, if you called Sears, you remember Sears? Um, you, he, would, he would be the one that picked up the phone and said, customer service, and he thought you were talking to Sears. Um, his relationship to Sears was he was an independent contractor hired by a small business that was uh, had a contract with a call center that had a contract with Sears. So he had questions about, like, is this really, I'm not quite making a minimum wage, and I think I'm still getting paid a lot more than this. Like, he can't call Sears. He can't tell someone, like, Sears, this band brand that doesn't want to be damaged, is hurting me, and even say anything because he's afraid, you know, if he fires, there's no wrong, there's no wrongful termination. It's even more intense with migrant workers. So since the late 1960s, most people apprehended by the INS worked in factories, not the fields. Um, and in the book, I write a lot about the history of Silicon Valley and how every major firm was subcontracting to these shops where, you know, this is why it's a giant Superfund site in California, where women and children and men, all from Central America, all from Southeast Asia, were doing work that was illegal. They were underpaid. It was violating all kinds of environmental laws. Um, there's a story in there that came out of the work of sociologists in the 80s showing um, women and children sitting around tables in, 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 the, in certain, part, certain neighborhoods in Los Angeles assembling microchips, putting, putting together circuit boards, and all these things you know, paid by the piece, like cigar rollers of the 19th century. Like This is all part of the system about who gets to have stability, and it's part of the future, too, and what you make choices. Okay, I think we'll take a couple more. There was a question over here. Yeah. Hi, I'm David D. Thompson. Thanks so much. This is uh, fascinating. It's depressing. I wanted to follow up on uh, Rodney's point and see if you see a hopeful, I guess I'm always looking for hope, right? But if you see a hopeful sign in the Affordable Care Act, in, in the employer mandate, maybe in paid family leave, and maybe in child care, that with some of these elements of the safety net, there is a growing expectation in the U.S. of corporate citizenship. I mean, the corporate is European says, look at us like we're nuts for, for not demanding more of our employees. And they start to see a turn there, and certainly in the Sanders campaign, you see some of that. I was wondering if you find that hopeful or if you find it not yet. Yeah, I don't think, uh, so um, this idea that like companies can, by their goodwill, solve these problems, I don't believe. Um, I think that um, a lot of times they're causing the same problems that they are talking about solving. Right, I mean forcing them to, like with the employer mandate, like actually forcing companies to buy insurance for their employees, right? Um, and so there have been some, um, <coughs> there have been some like kind of promising small experiments in like cities, which is where any of this would really come from, is first in like a city, um, and then be back in Seattle, um, passed a law that said Uber drivers, because again, people are talking about Uber, but maybe this could apply to other industries. Um, Uber drivers could unionize, um, so the Chamber of Commerce promptly sued them, and that's still working itself out, but interesting idea. Um, in New York City, the city just passed something that is sort of like a minimum wage, it's not quite the same thing for Uber drivers, so we had this idea like, oh, well the way the world works is that if you're classified as an independent contractor, you can have a minimum wage, but that's kind of an effort of like, oh, well why not, like, you actually could. I agree. I think all the interesting stuff is happening at the city level. So laws about algorithmic scheduling are being passed at the city level that guarantee workers' knowledge of where they're going to be working that week. Because you know this is important. You can't go to school or childcare or all these other things or have second even a second job without that. <coughs> that said, um, I am currently, and I think I know there's policymakers in the room. Like, we should be preparing for the next downturn. So when the next crisis happens. <laughs> We know that it'll probably look like the previous recessions where everyone will lose their jobs and never be hired back. And these jobless recoveries will happen 
Probably the kicker this time is I think that the pensions, will, well, many of them will probably fail, and we'll probably see the failure of the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation at the same time. So all of this will go swirling down the drain, I know, right? Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> Seriously. No, this is the moment, this is the moment, oh, this is the last chance for the federal government to matter before the left and the right agree that it's no longer about the federal government. And there'll be a reversion back to the state, to the local, and this is this is the hope. So we, we, the hope is we prepare now, thinking about what we want when that happens in the next couple of years, and how to approach it, rather than just saying, well, let's try it again like we did in '91. Let's try it again like we did in 2001. Let's try it again like we did in 2008. Let's hope the Democrats and Republicans at the national level will just magically pull out a bullet and save us. Right? I think that's the question we have to be asking ourselves. And I do think that this is an opportunity for a return to a more independent life, a more autonomous life. And for me, that is the real American dream, not a house, not a boss, but that. And I think that's something that all Americans, left and right, can agree on. And I think that's something that we should try to find common ground on uh, when the next crisis comes. I think we will take one last question. Um, well, thank you um, to both of you, to the three of you, actually. Uh, you took the words away from me. Uh, I have more of a statement uh, than a question. And I think um, as someone that's 50, and I heard the gentleman there saying, where, where do you go when you feel um, you can't go anywhere and disposable? Um, I think that what would really change to me is activism, education, outreach, and holding people accountable uh, it can start from your grassroots movements, you know, from your uh, community-based leaders, from your uh, mayor's office, from the government, from our senators and congressmen. Let's forget about political parties, but really holding them accountable because we should think as people and not as robots. I mean, when I go to Walmart and I see these automated uh, cash registers, you know, I'd rather stay and wait those 20 minutes because I know what that translates to. And you know, and, um, that has taken the tone of in the bank industry, everywhere else, there's always less jobs. So it's, it's accountability. Let's hold the representatives accountable. Um, let's start getting together and you know, fighting for the people because it's, it's pretty bad out there.
some fraction of that goes to all of us, just like the oil is pulled out of the ground, that money goes to all of us. I think we'd all feel a little better about that sleeping at night if we knew that was happening. Or investing in R&D. Or investing in R&D. I think the work that our scholarship is interesting, yeah. and in some ways more easier, with some of these digital tools, yeah. the same things that make it possible for us to structure work, where you get a pay and you have a contract for 10 minutes, um, could make it easier to run a co-op, run a business as a co-op. You don't need to get a building with stalls and pay rent. You can white label the same infrastructure as a marketplace for $30 a month. Um, so And platform cooperativism. So if you're interested yeah, in checking out stalls. platform <laughs> cooperativism. You know, how do we churn, how do we convince um, you know, unions start offering their services through platforms. You know, mm -hmm. how much would you pay for that? I think that's one of the things, helping those kinds of organizations. But I think what's important here is there's not a silver, there's not a magic solution. One bullet that will make, it's a yes and, yes and, yes and, yes and. Mm -hmm. That has to come from lots of different places and lots of different people across political lines, across geographic lines, to sort of make this economy work for us again. And on that relatively optimistic note, <laughs> <point, laughs> Thank you both very much for your time and generosity.